Uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, so glad to present our ICPC 2011 paper around design defects detection and correction by example that is uh, recently uh, selected for the most influential uh, paper award during the last 10 years uh, by ICPC 2021. Uh, so, so grateful for the community for, um, for considering uh, our work during the last uh, 10 years. And uh, today I'll be summarizing um, some of the impact that comes out of this uh, research. So back in 2011, uh, I was a PhD candidate and I was uh, in the last term of my PhD at the University of Montreal under the supervision of Professor Hawiri Sahrawi. And uh, well, who is the second author of this paper, he was an undergrad student uh, at that time uh, coming from University of Tunis and doing his um, senior project as an undergrad research experience in the lab at University of Montreal. And this work was in collaboration with Munir Bokadoum, who is a professor at UCAM and uh, finally Alioni was, uh, was uh, a PhD student in his first term uh, at that time. And uh, 10 years later, here are how the authors looks like. So uh, I joined the University of Michigan Dearborn as a faculty and uh, well, he's now also a faculty at uh, DePaul uh, University after 10 years. And uh, also uh, Huweri and Munir, they're still at University of Montreal. And finally, Ali, he's also a professor now at the uh, University of Quebec uh, in Canada. Probably one funny observation between 2011 and 2021 that uh, almost all the authors now have eyeglasses, not just me, like in 2011, uh, except probably uh, Alioni. So uh, during this talk, I will uh, try to uh, cover a little bit of the context of the work about the importance of this aspect of uh, quality assessment and refactoring. And um, I will be giving a brief overview, kind of a brief reminder of the approach and a few results from that paper. And then I would be explaining how we actually use that um, foundations that were actually proposed in that work in 2011 and how we build um, on that work to actually um, even uh, deploy uh, this type of work in, uh, in industry, of course, after so major um, improvements during the last 10 years and also I'll be summarizing how I mean the research community was uh, probably inspired by the by that work in different domains and finally I'll be sharing briefly some lessons learned and some uh, future research directions that could uh, continue enhancing um, uh, this line uh, so uh, probably many of you are familiar with refactoring and design defects and the simple way to represent uh, a messy code or a spaghetti code is with this metaphor. So if I ask you which one is easier to work with, of course, all of you will mention the one on the right side. It's very well structured. It's easy to modify, to deal with and to use, but the spaghetti that we have on the on the on the left side um, it's probably uh, hard to modify hard to use and this is the feeling of programmers in general when they deal with structure code and messy code and the consequence of that is like the cost of changing the code will dramatically increase and this is what we create the technical uh, depth where uh, it creates delay to uh, chip a new code to uh, fix box to modify existing features and so on and this is, could be accumulated uh, over time uh, so the consequence of that is like uh, programmers are currently based on different empirical studies spending over 70 percent of their time actually try to understand the code and making changes testing them it's require uh, just 30 percent of their time and also that's, of course, increased development costs because developer times could be translated into salaries, money, uh, and this is could have a, an increased development cost. And um, it's actually impossible 
to try to manually fix uh, and detect this quality issue. So example, one of our partners, eBay, they have over 10,000 apps and services that are running at the, back, at the back end of eBay.com. So that's why trying to semi automate refactoring, it's uh, very important. And that's include the detection of quality issues, their prioritization, and also uh, providing um, semi automated solutions uh, to fix them. And that could bring a lot of values in terms of fixing code uh, faster, in terms of reducing development costs, and also reducing um, technical debt and having more uh, focus dedicated to uh, functional <coughs> changes and, uh, and improvements. Uh, so at that time in 2011, we were really concerned to address some issues related to both the detection step of uh, anti-patterns, code smells, and then how to fix them. And uh, one of the challenges when we try to identify uh, quality issues like anti-patterns is um, the fact that we need to define rules for each of these defects, but at the same time, there's always, I mean, inconsistencies in terms of how the symptoms are could be translated in terms of metrics. So for the same symptoms, you may need to select various metrics and you may not be sure that all these metrics are relevant to characterize a specific symptoms and so on. So doing all of this manual work could be confusing, time consuming. And also one of the main challenges is how we can determine probably the right thresholds of these metrics, because this is our context dependent, this is depends on the project. So finding a way to actually define the thresholds of the metric to say, um, if you are higher than a specific number of lines of code or coupling or cohesion, then this is a blob, for instance, and so on trying to find an automated way to uh, deal with this threshold definition can be very important. And uh, the same thing applied to the fixing of this uh, design defects in, in general, because we may need to define a uh, refactoring sequence in order to uh, fix them. And it's hard to actually find template to fix these uh, issues. Um, because most of the time, no uh, box could fit uh, for, um, for any case, uh, because we need to actually establish a link between the refactoring strategies and the quality improvement, their goals. Uh, and that time, that uh, aspect was still uh, not very well uh, addressed. Uh, so what we have proposed in the intuition behind our work was to try to um, use those hypotheses or intuition that a good set of detection rules need to maximize the detection of probably a training set of design defects that could be manually uh, labeled, whether they are defect or not, and this rules could distinguish uh, between, um, between them. And uh, the second intuition is like a good refactoring or correction strategy should minimize the number of defects after applying the refactoring sequence. So the intuition behind this work was were pretty simple. And then uh, some of these intuitions are actually matching very well the philosophy and the, and the way how genetic programming actually works. So you have a solution as a program that try to um, to take actions that could actually um, that could actually uh, fit within specific uh, training set uh, expectations. Uh, so for that reason, what we use it as an input for the first step and also the second step is a base of examples of design defects that were manually labeled, and for that we use it. Some of the existing benchmarks uh, at that time, including the work of Moha, Stefan, Avoshi, and others. And then we tried to use uh, also as an input, a set of quality metrics, exhaustive set of quality metrics. And then we let basically the genetic programming figure out what combination of uh, metrics and also thresholds are actually relevant to identify and detect most of the expected um, defects and the base of examples. 
And then for the second step, we use those generated rules in order to actually uh, check whether applying a sequence of refactoring actually fix the defect or not. Basically, a defect is fixed if it is not detected anymore using the rules. So the intuition is pretty simple. So we use the genetic algorithm that try to find the best sequence of refactorings applied to the code that can actually reduce the number of defects that are detected using this best rules that were found in the first step. Uh, without going into a lot of details, so the idea of the first step was based on the genetic programming algorithm where a solution for our case are, is, are, is a set of rules that could be represented using a tree representation. And then we try to generate these trees, then applying basically these rules on the system used in our base of examples. And then we use this fitness function, the precision and recall comparing to our base of examples. So basically we try to cover as much as possible the expected defects and the best rules are the one that maximize that, uh, uh, that coverage. Um, and then for the second step, we use the genetic algorithm because of the large space to explore where we try to define a solution as a vector of a sequence of refactoring actions that could be taken on the code. And then after that, we tried to check whether each of the solutions uh, fix or not uh, defects that could be detected using the detection rules of the first step. Uh, and then we apply that at that time on four main open source projects. And we find actually uh, pretty interesting results based on manual uh, validation and an unfold uh, cross validation for both the detection of the effects and also the refactorings that were uh, manually validated. So this is a brief overview about uh, that work. And uh, of course we built up on, on that work and I'm very grateful to also all the um, industry feedback from developers who participate in the manual validation that actually shaped our uh, research um, until uh, until that we uh, achieve a pretty interesting results at the end, probably after 10 years from uh, starting uh, that work. Uh, so one of the first study that we uh, started to um, uh, extend our previous work was basically uh, published at TOSEM, where we tried to here deal with the challenge of the lack of diverse set of um, code smells in our training set because we are relying a lot when we generate these rules on the training set or basically the base of examples that we are using so in this work we adopted the novel optimization techniques it's called bi-level optimization where you have two levels of optimization instead of one where we try to have another level of optimization that actually generate artificial code smells that may look different than the code smells that we have in our training set, but they still represent an abnormal design. And, um, and for that, uh, we used a uh, heuristic search as well. And the two levels were communicating until that uh, the rules were actually, I, I detecting not only the examples of defect in our training set, but also the artificial ones that were identified by the lower level. So you can see the two levels are kind of competing with each others that the lower level try to probably generate some artificial smell that are different than uh, good design practices, but they still not detected by the detection rules. So, so the results were pretty interesting and we found even better results uh, in that uh, uh, adaptation. And we did even, uh, manual validation uh, with uh, an industry partner at that time. It was the Ford Motor Company. Uh, and uh, another uh, extension of that ICPC 2011 work was also done in 2014, uh, published at TSE, where we tried to address the problem of the lack of consensus between different um, design defect detection algorithm. And what we did, we ran in parallel 
different detection methods that has diff completely different ways to detect defects. And then these algorithms were communicating to each others. And then we tried to find a consensus between them by looking to the intersection of the results uh, in order to determine if the set of defects is kind of resilient enough or good enough um, to different methods. So you can see this as kind of the translation of how it works, for example, in practice, where, where a team uh, members are trying to discuss the quality of an architecture of a code, and then they converge together into a number of defects that need to be fixed. Uh, and that's also made the results better. And also we collaborated with Ford uh, at that time to validate this work. And uh, uh, in a follow-up uh, paper is what we did. We improved the correction step where in the ICPC 2011 work, we focused uh, mainly on a mono objective search that tried to just deal with the number of defects. And then in a follow-up work, what we did that we published a couple of papers at TOSM where we tried to use both multi and many object optimization algorithm to deal with the conflicting quality objective that you we might uh, deal with when we are trying to find a refactorings. Because for example, if you take even coupling, cohesion, they're already conflicting. If you take some specific type of defects, fixing them, could even, I mean, uh, be contradicting with other defects. So we try to find a trade-off between uh, different conflicting quality criteria when we find refactoring. And this is was published and uh, we found also pretty interesting result in collaboration with also a couple of uh, industry partners. Uh, after that work, one of the interesting outcomes actually that come from the manual validation of refactoring is like we got um, feedback from programmers telling us we may not really trust your automated, uh, fully automated refactoring solutions. And what that was a great takeaway at that time from the uh, collaboration with industry, where we tried to come up with a more realistic uh, solution to the problem that actually integrate the programmer in the loop and enable interaction between the programmer and uh, and the tool in terms of what defects they need to be fixed, what refactoring they may need to be uh, probably now updated. And we try to learn from that interaction with the user in order to have a better uh, ranking of which refactoring we have to recommend to the user. And then also we um, validated this work with a couple of um, industry partners, including Ericsson and uh, others. And uh, we found pretty interesting results and more pragmatic solution to the uh, to refactoring uh, in general. Um, and you can find more details in our TSC paper. Um, and then uh, one of the interesting work as a follow-up of this that we found that this interactive way and and um, and so on works pretty well in discrete environment. But how about continuous integration and trying to build a bot that could be realistic enough um, on, for example, GitHub and DevOps uh, environment? And we built uh, actually uh, a Git app that actually get notified whenever uh, a pull request is uh, submitted. And then the bot will go ahead and use those detection rules of ICPC 2011, identifying the defect and the strategies that we extended from our uh, ICPC 2011 work to actually find uh, refactoring and then submitting those refactoring as a pull request that can be reviewed by, uh, by programmers. And during code reviews, uh, it could be also uh, some possibilities to change um, the recommendations from the bot and so on. You can find more details in our AC 2019 paper. Um, and then after that, one of the challenges that we found when we did the manual validation of, uh, of, that, of those previous work, we found that still during the interaction phase, there are many refactoring involved and programmer they need to support to actually um, reduce the scope automatically of what refactoring they may need to 
interact with. So showing so many refactoring and so on may not be beneficial. It may create kind of a behavior to be a little bit reluctant to look at all of these um, issues. So we come up with a way to actually um, enable the exploration of both the decision and the objective space, basically the code changes at the file level and also what quality uh, we're addressed and, and we try to automatically identify the region of interest of what refactoring could be relevant for a specific programmer based on his or her history of um, uh, changes and previous interactions and so on. You can find more details in our TSC paper. And uh, also we extended also recently another TSC paper, that work of ICPC 2011 to cover as well the security part. And we found that a lot of the defects that were uh, identified and fixed and many of the refactoring are creating conflicts between the security aspect, like for example, the exposure of your code, like when you are trying to improve the extendability of your code or are creating more abstraction, you may make your code uh, more exposed to the vulnerabilities because if uh, you can access to the super class, you can actually get uh, this malicious code spread and the chart classes. So we try to provide kind of a scientific foundation of the correlation between quality improvement and, uh, and also security issues and provide refactorings uh, for that. And we built the whole uh, platform for that work. So you can see through this uh, couple of uh, quick demos, how this 10 years of work and uh, improvement actually led to uh, very mature tools that some of them that are available to the community, like uh, the, uh, if you go to uh, uh, refactor.iclab.us, you can actually use our platform uh, in the cloud. And, uh, and also we have developed uh, a Get app that is available on GitHub that you can actually use to refactor your code via pull request and, uh, and so on. And uh, that work actually enabled a different uh, direction during the last 10 years. Uh, one unique aspect I would say is like this work was used in multiple domains, not just about uh, object-oriented programming and so on. One interesting aspect, this is enabled new research direction in the area of service computing and web service anti-patterns. And many people use it as an inspiration to use that genetic programming approach in order to detect uh, anti-patterns in uh, web services and many works were done in that direction. And another completely different domain, which is in model-driven engineering, people use that work based on genetic programming to automatically generate transformation rules between source and target models and even doing migrations between uh, models and uh, they use that genetic programming approach even in uh, composite, uh, component based software to identify relevant refactoring. So it was used not only at the code level, but also at the model level. Also, uh, it was used beyond Java and object oriented design. We have seen people that got inspiration from that work and they applied for JavaScript, Python, and also beyond that for program repairs. So people, they use genetic programming by taking inspiration from that work to actually um, uh, go even beyond just uh, quality issues and provide um, a, a genetic programming approach for uh, even implementing some small and simple features. And also uh, some other studies also considered in the developer context when they are generating uh, the rules. So, um, so it was a lot of uh, studies in that direction that tried to generalize that ICPC 2011 work beyond uh, just Java and object-oriented design. Uh, uh, one interesting aspect to highlight, it was not just uh, a research impact, but also this work was actually deployed and used in industry, and we are actually forming a startup uh, around this work and we ensure kind of a technology transfer by licensing the inventions that comes out of this ICP 2011 and beyond. And one of our uh, case studies or pilot to highlight is the work with uh, eBay, where we tried really to deal with very large 
number of uh, application defects that need to be fixed and um, detected. And this is what's very costly for the company. You can imagine that at the back end of eBay.com, there is all, always more than one trillion of calls between apps running at uh, the um, back end of eBay.com. And this is could impact even the response time and uh, so on. And, and, and the cost of running all of these uh, clones and the code and extra costs is over $50 million uh, per year. So if you can deal with the different issues that are related to high coupling and clones and reducing that by half, you are saving the company over um, $25 million. And this is, was part of the reasons how this work was actually deployed in the company and used it as part of the quality gates and actually save the companies um, a large amount of money in terms of how to deal with um, this um, uh, bad code and how this could impact uh, even the uh, response rates and uh, so on when users are using ebay.com. Uh, also, there are a lot of uh, probably uh, lessons that we learned uh, and reflections. Um, I would say one of the main lessons that I learned during the last 10 years was about the importance of the collaboration with the original uh, programmers of uh, systems uh, from industry and building up this industry collaboration. It's in general very time consuming and very hard to do to set up and uh, but at the same time, it's very beneficial because many of the collaborations uh, actually led to uh, new scientific foundations, all the work that we did around interactive refactoring and, uh, and probably the maturity of our platforms comes from all of these this discussions that came from the manual validation of our tools rather than just reporting numbers of precision recall that may look high and so on. And um, the second aspect that we learned is like human studies and soft engineering are challenging, but very beneficial. And um, probably you may see a lot of papers around doing this kind of validation with students. It's great for integrating research with education and so on. They are easy to scale and also good way to get papers accepted and so on. But we may not learn a lot out of this and we need to focus more on realistic validation, even at the small scales. And I hope that we understand that having 14 or 15 programmers from an industry partners who are validating your tool and they are the original programmers um, of the systems and the code is much more beneficial than getting 50 or 100 students validating their, your code. So they are hard to scale, but at the same time, difficult to publish because not many people may have their hands dirty around this aspect of doing all of this um, validation in realistic environment. And the final aspect that I want to highlight is like technology transfer and getting mature research solutions for industry require focus. You cannot jump between contributions and problems and expect that you have a high level of maturity that your work could be deployed one day and impact society. It's not easy to do, especially in North America where we have specific culture of funding and the tenure environment that require many publications. But at the same time, I think aiming to publish in, in a reputable venues could be as well correlated with making a real impact and thus require a lot of focus um, on and also getting the right collaborators from industry and beyond to actually um, get to that level. Um, as a future research direction that we are working on and we may also suggest is we may need to work more on creating automated solutions for benchmarking because all the data that you are using to generate your detection rules or refactoring are very sensitive to the data and generating the right benchmark for your project could be an interesting problem. Another interesting problem is about the self-healing uh, software and how to use this refactoring for interesting problems related to autonomous cars, for instance, like the number of uh, uh, lines of code, for example, in typical uh, software running in autonomous cars is over a billion um, of lines of code. 
and also this uh, initiative that we have around refactoring bot probably it's kind of a first milestone but this has made it quite several years of research especially how we can actually deal with the context and making the bot aware of the context information uh, and so on to make more relevant refactoring rather than just focusing on the correctness of the refactorings. So thanks again for your attention and hopefully uh, this is was kind of a summary of what we did and what the research community did during the last 10 years after publishing that paper. So thank you very much. Hello and welcome to the most influential paper award from 10 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, we were uh, not in a pandemic and we were having a real live conference in Kingston, Canada. Uh, unfortunately, now uh, there are more people that can join, but we are virtual. That being said, uh, it's my honor to, together with Filip Rogica, have uh, to have chaired the most influential paper award session for this year's ICPC and the paper Design Defects Detection and Correction by Example is the winner. Um, I have a few of the authors here, uh, but Marwan Kesenti, uh, Kesentini, sorry, will actually be presenting today. And that being said, uh, Marwan, the floor is absolutely yours. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Andy. So I'm assuming you can see my screen and uh, and my slides. Uh, so first of all, uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, everyone depends on your location. And uh, uh, today we'll be presenting our uh, paper that actually was published 10 years ago. And we are so grateful to the community for selecting us and considering our work for the most influential paper work for the last 10 years in ICPC 2021. Uh, so basically our work is about design defect detection and correction by example. And here are the authors like uh, 10 years ago, I was a PhD student at University of Montreal under the supervision of uh, Howery, who was professor at University of Montreal. And uh, well, he was uh, an undergrad student at that time. He was doing his undergrad research experience as part of a senior project. And Munir, his professor at the uh, University of Quebec at Montreal. And uh, Ali was joining uh, the team as a new PhD student at, at that time. Then uh, 10 years later, probably, as you can see, almost everybody has eyeglasses now, except probably Ali. So uh, I'm now here in Michigan, and well, he's a faculty in Deepol, Hawari and Munir, they're still staying there in their uh, universities. And Ali, he's also a professor at the um, University of Quebec. So almost all the author decided to uh, take an academic career uh, path. And uh, we, uh, as we showed during the presentation that we are still working on this area of uh, refactoring and uh, design defect detection and so on. So during this talk, uh, I would be trying to give a brief overview about the context of the work, why it's an important problem, and give an overview, brief overview about that work that was published 10 years ago, and how we actually extended that work, and uh, how this would probably making some in impact ba basically both, both in academia and industry, and how it get deployed recently in some big organization like eBay. And I'll be sharing briefly some lessons learned around um, that and brief uh, overview about research directions. Uh, so if I ask you, like, which one is easier to work with, of course, you will tell me the one on the right side, because it's well structured, easy to deal with, uh, to work with. But the one on the left side, you can see it's kind of a spaghetti code over there. You can imagine it that it's very hard to change, very hard to deal with it. That's exactly the feeling of programmers when they deal with uh, messy code. And the consequence of that, that programmers will spend um, more than 60 or 70 percent of their time based on some empirical studies on understanding the code and figuring out how to make the changes, then changing the code itself 
and testing it will require much less effort. So if you can imagine how this time spent could be translated into dollars, basically the salaries of these programmers and so on, this is could cost a lot of the companies, not only from developers perspective, but even for the resources that need to be used to execute messy code and so on. Like our partner eBay, as I would show later, they were spending like 50 million dollar just to run over 10,000 apps in the back end of, um, of uh, ebay.com. So it's really impossible to manually try to deal with detection and uh, correction of quality issues uh, in, in, uh, in general. And that's why it's really important to try to think about some semi-automated solutions to deal with this uh, problem that could detect this uh, this uh, design defects or code smells and try to prioritize them since we cannot fix all of them and finally fixing them. And this is could bring a lot of values in terms of fixing uh, code faster and reducing the cost of technical debt that associated with that and even increasing retention rates of uh, programmers. That's what we actually observed uh in, in industry in general that uh this is also an important factor to increase retention rate of uh, programmers so at that time we tried to uh, deal with some challenges in in that icpc 2011 paper where uh we found that there is in general no consensus about what the symptoms for each of this defect or how to translate some of the symptoms like for example large class or large method or um, in terms of metrics and uh, and one of the main challenges was about how to determine the thresholds automatically because defining the thresholds of the metric manually could be challenging as well because it really depends on the context uh, and uh, in terms of correcting once we detect this uh, this def uh, design defects or code smells the the challenge is how we can actually find a refactoring solution that is not probably standard for every single uh, type of uh, design defect because there were some studies that tried to provide some standard solutions but we are advocating that probably there is no box that could fit all and uh, and we try to look at this problem from another perception how we can deal with the identified defects that we can actually um, fix them so the intuition behind that work was pretty straightforward so we tried to start from two intuitions the first one is like uh, if we want to really generate good quality of detection rules for for smells in general we may think about trying to increase the coverage of some expected uh, defects or smells that need to be uh, covered and then trying to uh, generate rules that can cover as much as possible uh, these expected uh, smells. And then once we have this best rules that identify different type of smells, we try to actually uh, use um, the intuition that we need to find the best sequence of refactorings that can actually uh, fix those defects by trying to use the detection rules again after applying those refactoring on the code to see if they are actually fixed or not. So based on this two intuition, we build this approach at that time where we have two phases. The first phase that use actually a base of examples of, uh, of code smells. And then we try to use an exhaustive set of quality metrics. So we have different quality metrics. We use them as an input. And then the genetic programming algorithm, because the large search space that we need to explore in terms of the combination of the metric, the thresholds of the metric, try to actually find the best coverage of this defect. So our fitness function, our evaluation function of the best rules is actually the, the coverage of these uh, examples using precision recall. Um, and then once we find this best rules, we actually use them in the correction step. So we take as an input an exhaustive set of refactoring types that could be applied to the code. And then we try to actually use the detection rules on the code after refactoring to see how many of the defects get actually fixed. And our solution in that case is the sequence of uh, refactorings that are applied to the code. So basically for the first phase, we use a genetic programming since by intuition, the genetic programming actually works uh, within that uh, philosophy of trying to 
use a solution as a tree where our tree in this case is actually a set of rules and we can represent it as each node of this rules could be either a metric with an assigned threshold or a logical operator to combine uh, these different uh, metrics to form the rules. Then once we are able to generate multiple solutions, we evaluate them based on how many defects were identified uh, comparing to our base of example, and then we repeat those steps until finding the best set of rules. And then for the second phase, what we try to do is to use a genetic algorithm where we try to find the best combination of refactorings that after applying them, minimize the number of defects that are discovered using this best rule. So as you can see, the idea is simple, uh, it's straightforward, and uh, we found actually pretty good results at that time using some really uh, few, I mean, uh, open source projects uh, and using an existing uh, benchmark at that time by Noel and uh, and Stefan Boucher and others that actually contain labeled uh, defect, uh, design defects. So after that work, uh, we did the civil extension and we used this foundations to actually uh, build up uh, on it and make uh, several uh, improvements. So the very first one that we published in TOSAM uh, in 2014 was actually to deal with the problem that our training set that we are using to generate the rules may not be enough. So we added another level that we call the lower level here, and that's why we use it what we call bi-level optimization, where you have two levels of, the, of optimization that are competing. One is trying to generate this detection rules using that genetic programming. And then the lower level is trying to generate some artificial example of code smells that deviate from good practices of design. And, uh, and then we try to make sure that the lower level compete with the other level that can generate examples that cannot be detected by the detection rules. Then the upper level will update these detection rules to be able to cover this artificial code smells example. So here we try to deal with the problem of the training set and the example and how we can generate a new knowledge, new set of examples uh, by trying to create this competition between the two levels. And another uh, TSC paper as an extension of that work, what we did is to try to deal with the problem that when we are using, I mean, techniques uh, for detecting code smells, um, in general, you can have multiple experts' opinion. That's even happened in practice. So we said, why not to uh, propose a parallel uh, optimization approach where you have multiple techniques to detect the code smells, and then these techniques will try to negotiate together, looking to the intersection of their results and trying to converge toward the consensus about what are the real smells in your code. And then we tried to use as one of the techniques this genetic programming approach, and we found better uh, detection uh, results for um, for that uh, for that parallel approach. And then uh, another and another extension in two thousand paper, we try to uh, extend the mono objective way that we used in that ICPC paper, where we just focusing on fixing code smells as one of uh, as one as 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 our objective. So we what we try to do is basically to consider multiple objective and even many objectives where we are trying to consider the history of changes. We considered also the semantic uh, similarities. We uh, we also uh, try to use still the structural metrics. So we try to combine them together in terms of finding the best uh, sequence of refactoring that could uh, solve uh, the defects. And we found very interesting results in collaboration with some industry partners like Ford, uh, Ericsson's and uh, other. And uh, after that work, I remember one of uh, the main feedback that we got from uh, the manual inspections of our results by one of our industry partner was like, they didn't actually trust a lot automated tools for refactoring. So they tried to um, influence our research by uh, proposing some ideas about how we can interactively um, create, I mean, uh, 
interesting refactoring recommendations where the programmer could interact with the tool and you can actually learn from this type of interaction. For example, if you find that the programmer is rejecting refactoring about specific file, we can generate a constraint that we don't recommend any more refactoring for, for that specific file. If you find that uh, the programmer, we can learn that uh, his or her, or her focus is more on fixing one type of a smell or one, uh, one specific quality uh, or, or other purposes, so we can generate more refactoring in that direction. So we try to enable that interaction with the programmer based on that work where we consider a semi-automated way to look at the problem. And then uh, we extended that work later in ASC 2019, where we actually built uh, a solution based on this ICPC 2011 paper for continuous integration, where we actually built a bot as a Git app that get notified whenever changes are done in the code, like we analyze the pull request that is uh, submitted by the programmer, we look to the files that are changed, and then we try to use the detection rules in order to actually uh, come up with a set of refactoring that fix locally, I would say, specific files that are of the interest of the uh, programmer. Um, also, uh, another uh, problem that we addressed in an XTSC paper where we try to address the problem of the interaction with the programmer because we found that having too many interactions with a programmer may not be actually useful, especially for the context of refactoring. So what we try to do is to actually try to combine the use of clustering with multi-objective to actually identify different region of interest by interaction of the programmer and reducing the space of looking to the solution based on uh, what we learned from the interaction with the programmer, from what we learned from the history of uh, previous refactorings and code changes that were applied by the programmer, and we tried to reduce the scope of the interaction a lot, and that's improved the results. And uh, also in another TSC paper, we tried to uh, go beyond uh, quality, and uh, we found actually that there is kind of sometimes a negative correlation between improving some quality aspect with security. Like for example, if you want to increase the extendability of your code, that will may expose your code uh, to vulnerabilities because if uh, if if uh, an attacker could access to the superclass, make access to uh, the child class, and so on. So there are uh, we showed like empirically uh, that uh, there are some negative correlation between improving some quality aspect with the security of your code, and then we built uh, a whole uh, framework that can deal not only with the detection of, uh, uh, with the rules to detect this quality issues, but combining this with also uh, security and recommending the right refactoring that can uh, look at both uh, together. And probably after 10 years from working on, on all of this, uh, all of this aspect, we, we were actually to uh, provide to the community uh, I mean, uh, a public uh, framework that could be used in the cloud, which is refactor.icilab.us. And also we built a get app that could be used based on that foundational work of ICPC uh, 2011. So basically, if you go to, uh, to our uh, platform on uh, refactor.icilab.us, you can request an account and you can access to all of this work of detecting quality issues and benchmark that include both sanitized industry project from our partners and also open project. And you can analyze in just a few minutes the quality of your project and we can give you even refactoring recommendations uh, based on that. So we can generate a whole report about uh, your code comparing to a specific benchmark and also what uh, what refactorings you may need to apply based on on your needs and you can even see the code before and after and if you actually approve any of the refactoring it will generate uh, a commit in your uh, repo so you can find more details over there and the same thing apply for the first refactoring board that we propose and also we have another platform which is qscored.com, it was done in collaboration with Tushar about this. Um, so uh, also, uh, Howeri and uh, his team, they also provided 
other extensions of that uh, ICPC uh, 2011 paper. So basically, um, basically they proposed a different uh, uh, extension in terms of how we could co-evolve uh, the changes that are done at the metamodal level uh, to actually transformation rules between models. Like, uh, for example, when we do migration between UML 1.0 to 2.0, how this is, would impact your current models, the transformation rules to other languages, and and they use it the by example approach in order to fix the the rules, the models, and there are different models paper that they published on that, and then they extended this work as well in other venues about automatically generating transformation rules to migrate between models to update OCL constraints and so on, and you can find uh, more details in their papers in that direction as well. Uh, so I want to summarize briefly some of the uh, impact out of this work. And one thing that we were glad to see is like uh, this work was adopted in other domains, and this is part of actually uh, a great way to generalize the results like there were so many works about applying exactly the same work of icpc 2011 to actually generate detection rules of quality issues for the quality of services for web services uh and uh and, and so on so that work was used uh, even in other domains and the same thing for the model driven engineering the same a uh, type of approach were adopted and generalized it for ATL model transformation and um, and other type of work. And also, it was used beyond uh, Java because our work was mainly for Java object-oriented programming. So it was mainly used for um, anti-patterns uh, and refactoring for even Python code, looking to the correlation between the detected smells using these rules and the energy efficiency of application. It was also uh, use it um, on uh, uh, the reusability of software libraries, uh, and uh, and even there were some uh, work that get inspiration from that work to even make functional changes, not just non-functional changes to the code using the same approach of genetic uh, programming. Uh, so, in terms of uh, uh, industry impact and uh, and technology transfer, although we had different. Uh, collaboration and those inventions were licensed by multiple partners. I want to, to share with you this really interesting case study and how we deployed uh, this work uh, actually at eBay, of course, after different uh, extensions. And the problem that we were dealing with is like uh, the company was spending more than $50 million just to be able to run so many, I mean, applications the back end of eBay.com that were actually uh, very consuming because they have extra codes, they have clones in their code, they have duplications, they have uh, high coupling. So basically, if you can refactor their uh, architecture and their application uh, and reducing the calls by like half, that will save the company $25 million in terms of cloud resources that they are used to run them. And, uh, and they tried multiple tools, including SonarCube and, uh, and many other, and we adjusted our work to make sure that we can correlate this detected smells that they factoring them with other quality of services like response time, availability, and so on. And um, it was deployed in different levels, even at the executive's level, that it's part of the dashboard that they can see online about what's going on in their current repos and uh, what recent changes that are done that can impact their uh, performance and so on. And we just recently got an NSF grant to actually uh, uh, continue building on the startup that we built around this as well. So finally, I want to share with you a couple of uh, lessons that we learned during this last 10 years. Uh, the first one is like uh, the collaboration with industry in general are challenging, very time consuming, uh, hard, but at the same time, they are very beneficial. So in our 2011 paper, probably you focused on precision recall and so on, but I would say that the main uh, lessons that we learned were actually by getting programmers who are original programmers uh, and original developers of the code to give us a real insight and a real feedback about our results. So this is was extremely relevant for us and shaped uh, actually the next papers that we built 
uh, out of this. This was very important, but at the same time, it was very time consuming, very challenging. Um, and uh, the second uh, the second thing that I want to share with you is about human studies and software engineering. So uh, I hope that uh, as a community, we think twice about numbers versus quality of uh, like participants. So because it's very easy to do human studies with high number of participants where none of them is actually part of the original developer of the system. It's very easy to, to scale. It's, it's easy probably to get those papers uh, accepted, but at the same time, it's very valuable to actually have few programmers who are actually very knowledgeable about the code, especially when we talk about problems like refactoring and quality improvement, who can actually give you the real feedback, insightful feedback, and making the validation actually as realistic as possible. So even if you have 10 or 15 programmers, that's actually very beneficial and it should not be considered as a weakness in general. They hope that our junior journey during the last 10 years can show you that um, we can reach a higher level of maturity of our research by doing this type of validation rather than thinking just about the next paper to publish. And reaching that maturity takes time, but also require focus. So it's really hard to jump between papers and basically problems and expect that uh, that work could be actually useful for society or deployed by companies. So it takes 10 years or more of focus of trying to actually solve the real problems. But of course, there are several challenges associated with us, including the current funding system, the tenure requirements, especially in North America and beyond, and also uh, some of our cultures. So, so that's an important aspect I want to share. And uh, as part of future research direction, I really I would like to invite the community to look at uh, a recent repository that we actually built about 30 years of uh, refactoring research, where we actually uh, put all the papers that were published by the communities and in a really very uh, nice and visual way to look at all the publication very quickly is like looking to the authors. Uh, they are also uh, classified. We created taxonomy for that. You can just use them to filter out the papers uh, and so on. So it will help you to actually even think about what could be the future of refactoring based on what we have seen during the last 30 years. Another important aspect of refactoring that I want to highlight that is still underexplored is about uh, refactoring and self healing of software in cyber physical system. Like if you think about autonomous cars, uh, typically autonomous cars are having around 1 billion of lines of code and there are actually very few support in terms of self healing and refactoring for this kind of context. So probably we may need to focus on this kind of problems as a community. Uh, rather than probably continue on the behavior preservation, this kind of thing, because I believe this are very important area to explore. And we are doing currently some collaboration with Ford and other companies in this space. And also another challenge that I see that could be very relevant in the future is about how we can actually build a real member of, of your software engineering teams that could actually consider very well the context of the development and how we can actually better integrate all of this work and development pipeline like Jira and uh, beyond. So thanks again for your attention and welcome for any questions. Thank you, Marwan, and uh, excellent presentation. Um, and I would even say congratulations again for winning the most influential paper words at ICPC. Thank you. I don't see any questions yet. Um, what I was actually wondering, um, I liked how you highlighted the question. Uh, and I think most of us here in the room agree um, that this is very important. Now, you've, you've been going through several iterations of, of refactoring research. Um, and I was actually wondering, is industry more receptive nowadays than they were like 10 years ago when you approached them with refactoring research? Yeah, I would say yes. And that's again, depend on the context uh, because uh, for some companies like what I said for eBay, 
they're actually spending millions of dollars because of their messy code. So actually, they can see the value of refactoring, especially for companies who are dealing with web services and so on. So they can see the value of that right away. Uh, for some other companies, for example, those I was mentioning, for example, autonomous cars. This is also another important area where actually the car nowadays is basically the software running uh, into it. So we need to optimize it and so on. So this is an important aspect. But of course, if you approach partners just in terms of this behavior preservation code changes without showing them the benefits actually of the refactoring and how this is could lead to improvement and so on, it may lead to sometimes some uh, tensions around about the value of this research uh, for them. So it's all about the context and how we can sell this idea of the refactoring to bring values to the companies. All right. Thank you very much. We have eight seconds to go. I, th I see that Alexander still has a question. Maybe we can discuss that during the break because now we have a 10 minute break coming.